So Simply Shy wants to know, do you guys recommend game development as a side project for fun and learning to think like a programmer? I think if you're going to, um, if you want to build a game, that's great. If you want to build websites, don't mess with game programming. They're different. Different techniques, different skills, do whatever. It's whatever you want to do. If you want to get into game development, then you got to build games. If um, learning to think like a programmer, I would still focus on the things I'm going to get a job with. You can think like a programmer as a web developer. You solve different problems with games than you do web anyway. So there's it's a different, it's different tools. It's, it's a completely different type of development. But hey, if you want to make a game or release it on Steam as a side project, make it 99 cents and see if you can get, you know, 200 people to download it. Go for it. We also yeah. kind of recommend the path to be, if you do want to do that, the path to get into it, because it is a more niche like yeah. area, right? There's going to be less, definitely less game yep. developers than there are web developers. So you could learn web development first and do that and then kind of learn game development after that. Doing it the other way around is kind of like you immediately jumping into a smaller pool. It's easier to go from the yeah. big pool. And if that's what you want to do, go, go for it. Build a game, release something so that you can show somebody that you can build games and you'll be hired quicker than with, hey, I really like this and I can do this. Give me a shot type resumes. But um, I think Unity is the best way to build something right now that you could release as an indie game developer and stick it on Steam. I think that's the best way to do it right now. Yep. All right, cool. Uh, let's see. Oh, so Joe's here. Joe, we looked at Joe's uh, portfolio on Tuesday. Okay, so cool. Thanks for the review on Tuesday. It is a work in progress. Okay, that's, that's just what we suspected. Um, with the coding challenge projects have already helped me in job searches and recruitment. Awesome. Yep. Make sure you show those. I know, man, it works. Put those just out keep there. Showing them show off, them. man. Show them off, exactly. Yeah. That's cool. Thanks for submitting your portfolio to you, by the way. Yeah, yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah. Like that. No, always like to give feedback. It helps. Uh, Dakota says, How ready quotes, do you think most of us will feel after completing a bootcamp like Coda Foundry? It's shaky confidence at first, pretty common. Uh, it depends on who you are. Um, we try to make you confident. Um, if you can build a if you can build the bug tracker coming out of the bootcamp like Coda Foundry and talk about it, you'll get a job. You should be confident because I there is no project as big as this from any learning institution that you can go to. I don't think, I mean, like, uh, maybe something at MIT where you've got a robot that blows up the world or something. I don't know, but like in general, like if you go to any kind of web development course, building a bug tracker is usually not part of that course because it is so difficult to do. There is so many moving parts and it's so large. It's very enterprise oriented. Um, if you can build that, that's why it shows so well. And that's why I think um, we did our stats for last year. And I don't mind exposing these stats because uh, we went back and we had to do our, our year in review. And we had a graduated students. 96% of those students are working as devs right now, or last year. That's, so that's great. pretty cool. That, that's of graduates. Not, not, we're not saying. Now, not everyone graduated. Not everybody graduated. Yeah, just, just to put a caveat. Okay, we're being up front. <laughs> but if you, what, what, but it goes with my thing. If you can build these projects and you can build a butt tracker and you can talk about it, you're pretty much going to get a job. Um, so, and in that, we don't say that to say, hey, come to Code Foundry, we're the only way to do it. We're saying that if you know how to code, you have a job. We teach people to code and we do it at this level. We go straight to the enterprise level. It's not what's easy down here. It's what's we feel is necessary for you to know to like get a job. Now, can you do less and get a job? Yes, but we tend to like that. Like, we're not trying to do the bare minimum. We're trying to go, Let's just go for the gusto. Let's just go for the, the juggler, that, so they say, and get a job. Let's just do what we can guarantee you and get a job if you can build this. Now, not everyone builds all the stuff here. Some people fail, and we try to coach them out of that. Some people quit. We try to coach them out of that. Some people disappear. We don't know why. But, like, in general, if you can talk about a project like the, the bug tracker at a de detailed level, you're going to get a job because you know how to code. It's not a secret. It's not a myth. It's not a, a magic pill. Um, right. There's a lot of work involved in getting to that level here at Coder Foundry. So we're talking seven to 800 hours over 12 weeks. That's a, it's a lot of work, but you know, and that work and repetition builds confidence. 
But do some people walk out of here and they're like, I'm not ready. I, I'm scared. I don't want to interview. Yes, that happens. And yeah. we try to tell them like, hey, if you follow these things, do it. That's why we built the interview course. If you follow the interview course and you're going through the boot camp and you do those things in the interview course, you'll perform better in an interview. And the better you perform, the more likely you are to get hired. As simple as that. I now, think some it's often people like we feel more are just really good at interviewing. That's yeah, true. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's true. that's true. Yeah. Yeah. It's often that people come out and like, if we see that you built the bug track and you graduated the class, we always feel confident that you can run and, and grab something. Yeah. And we're, we're always more confident than, than, the, than the student is a lot of times. We're like, oh, yeah, this yeah. is like, you got this. Like, we're seeing what you got. We see what you can do. And it's like, yeah, yeah, you got this. So I'll also say, too, over the last year, I think there's a, a, a few reasons why that number's more. Because before this, yep. we were in the 80s. Right, um, yeah. We would job placement in the 80s thing. So I think a few things have changed. The market's definitely changed, which should be encouraging for everybody. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah. It's, there's way more people getting hired right now, for sure. So that's that's been good, especially over the last, you know, it's COVID, really. Like, after that initial, yeah. like, thing, it's just gone up and up and up. And actually, for devs, we yeah. never really had a, a downturn for it. It just it right. stayed, and now it's just gone up. Mm -hmm. So that's that's definitely yeah. one of the reasons. And obviously, we, we, we constantly change our program, too. So there's that, too. We're always trying to make it better. We're always trying to make right. it so that people, more people will get jobs. So I think those two things combined have, have really helped. Yeah. Um, and then we change, we, you know, we keep changing our program and our recruiting process. So like yeah, we change the recruiting uh, process. Yeah. Yeah. And then we change the outbound process, like trying to make, how do we help the student find jobs? So we do a lot of proactive things that other, other boot camps are doing. It's crazy. Like we're looking at job boards every single day, trying to find what jobs were posted in the last 24 hours, what would hit our students correctly out of those. And then push those to a list and then the students apply to those and then we turn around and call the companies that the students apply to and recommend them for the role so that just takes a lot of time and effort and then you know for every cohort we're not working in every city in america we're looking at hey we got these 20 people what locations are they in okay that's where our job focus is you know and then we're always supposed to remotes then we find them so that's kind of what we do um now could you do that without us absolutely you could yeah. get on indeed and look every morning and look in your area every single morning, find the jobs that are posted in your area, see the ones that hit you in the wheelhouse with the skills that you've learned, whether that's C Sharp or Mongo or whatever it is, then turn around and call that company and go, hey, I just applied. Um, here's three reasons why I think I'm a fit for it. Um, can you look at my portfolio? Now, all of our students coming here have portfolios that have sales artifacts that we can show um, employers and that's why it works. So when we tell you, hey, this is what works, this is our advice, where some YouTubers might think, they might think it works, we're actually doing this every single day. <laughs> like, and so like, and our advice may change because like we're, we're actually trying to find people job every single day, like that's what we do. And so then we just share our secrets with you, whether you come to CF or not. And I think that's one of the reasons our YouTube channel does well because we're not necessarily asking you to become a coder founder. We're just saying, here's how you find a job. This is how we do right. it. Why don't we just share it with everyone else? Yeah, we've seen what so works, works. So here you go. Like, yeah, yeah if you can do this, yeah. like, please do it this way. Because we know. And, I, and, and then it's funny when we get pushback, they'll say, well, if you call HR directly, they'll just tell you to apply and get in line. You know, and I'm like, well, that's <laughs> not they? what they always say to us when we call. <laughs> <Will> <laughs> <they>? So <laughs> it, it's not theoretical, I guess where some people give theoretical advice how to find a job. Ours is based in, hey, this is how we do it. This works. Now, does it work 100% of the time? No. We're trying to get one yes. And so we're willing to say, hey, interview 10 times, interview 100 times. We don't really care as long as you get that one yes. Um, does every HR manager we call uh, take our call? No. So do we follow with the email? Yes. Do we hit them on LinkedIn in message? Yes. We hit all three of them and we try to bring awareness to that application so that they'll pull it off the stack, look at it, and then at least you can get an interview. So that's what we do. It takes a lot of time and effort. Um, that's why people come to us. And I think if you followed our methods, it would work as well. Yep, definitely. So I think like in summary, if you've graduated a boot camp, um, I'm going to say most boot camps. If you graduate any reputable boot camp, right? Let's say that you, you know, yeah. any, any one of the, any one of the, the named reputable yeah. boot camps. If you've done that and you have some projects to talk about, you should and you, and you graduated and you had everything, you should feel pretty comfortable that you can get it. Yeah. 
you can get a job, especially at the junior level. Yep. yep. I think you can do it. All right. Sorry about that rant, but let's see what else we can help. <laughs> That's a let's long see. code grinding commercial. Um, is Laravel 9 good to start off with backend development in 2022? Yeah, that's that's if you want to do that, it's fine. You know, PHP, um, if you're doing it, just, you know, that's make what sure you that you know, like, coding. just, yeah, make sure you know What's why you're doing that is. too, right? Just yeah. exactly what your job market is. And make sure to account for the PHP WordPress stuff too. Like, yeah. Laravel is a better term to look for than. Having said that, we had a company come in to Coder Foundry. And I don't mind telling you that it came into Coder Foundry. They want to hire four people, their PHP roles. So our .NET people are going to be taught PHP at this place. And so that doesn't mean we are fully aware that PHP exists. Laravel 9 being probably the most favorable framework for building things in PHP. If you're doing it modernly, if you're doing PHP 5, code igniter and those other kind of older ones um larval nine would be the one i would pick if i was doing um php um so i think that's fine but yeah it is in and around typically around wordpress is what they're doing and so um, i've turned down some php work uh, in the last couple of months where people want me to build things integrating with wordpress sites i'm not too excited about that it doesn't mean that other people can't make a living doing it right either so right. I think but it's well, fine. I mean, it I mean, there's like, definitely the work out there. They, they, yeah, you know. there's work out there to do. So, sure. Yep. Um, here we go. Alexander wants to know, I don't have, I don't want to go to college. I want to complete on their bootcamp and then go for a job. Should I also finish college too? Not if you don't want to. <laughs> so, I mean, <laughs> but I would say there is a caveat okay. there. You were talking about don't want yeah. to go, but then you also talk about finishing. So if you're already going and you're so far in, finish it. If you haven't started it, you don't need to start it. I guess that. No. Nah. <laughs> and then you can win a job with projects without a college degree. You can. Yeah. All right. But if you're in your fourth year, I would say you've already got finish money invested and a time invested. Finish it out. It will help you in your job search having that degree, especially the first job. Second, third job, not so much. Um, it doesn't really help you. Second, third job, it, the, uh, coding is a very, what have you done lately type environment? Like what have you been working on lately? Um, what can you do today? Not where you went to school, no one cares, but the first role, it can bring some credibility to you. But ultimately, if you do it correctly, you've got them looking at your portfolio anyway. So whether you went to MIT or no college, you're going to end up showing their portfolio anyway. And what can I do? And this is what I can do. And that's usually what moves the needle in an interview anyway. So, but some companies do value CS degrees and they do look at that. But I promise you, as you get to three to five years, no one's yeah. looking at where you went to school. They don't care, you know? So, and it's just proven the fact that we're hiring people from other C's overseas from India, China, Southeast Asia, they're coming into the U.S. on H-1Bs. I um, mean, they're not, the companies aren't validating those um, college transcripts or where they went to school. They have no wow. idea if, just that if that's a good job. institution of higher learning. They have no idea. So, like, they're just looking at what can you do? What have you done lately? And so, um, if you don't want to go and you haven't started, try to build some projects and, and do it on your own. You definitely can do it. Plus, yeah, plus you can do kind of the, the bootcamp round. It can be way quicker, right? If you do an in-person bootcamp yep. or a virtual bootcamp, whatever, you can do do that in 12 weeks and you can turn that around kind of quick. Um, if it's not something that you like doing, let's say that you've, you have you spend, I don't know, wh whatever it is, $15,000 on it, right? And and then it ends up not being for you for some strange reason. Let's say you go through it and then you don't like yeah. it. It's like the other alternative is spend four years and like hundreds of thousands of dollars, this if you're in the US. Right, especially um, in the US, yeah. And then it's like, you still might not like it at the end of that either. So yeah. it's like, you know, you end up with the same kind of thing. One's quicker and cheaper. Well, yep. go for it. Uh, let's see. Sam says, Hey, Hey Sam says, I'm tired of shoveling snow. Is that, I mean, shoveling snow okay. right now, like literally shoveling <laughs> snow this morning. I mean, like in general shoveling snow, I don't know if this means in general. Did you do that snow. as a career? He says, maybe, a career uh, maybe. snow maybe. shoveler. Maybe. Uh, okay. Maybe I started learning one year ago. I don't know where to go next to enable myself to provide more value and capture a good job. Python, SQL, Power BI, uh, Power Builder, etc. Power BI, which would be like power data BI. analytics. 
yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So business intelligence. So yeah, you can, um, you need to build a portfolio of projects that you can show people and then start interviewing with those projects as your primary sales vehicle. That's all I can tell you. So, um, so Python, Power BI and SQL, those are good skills if you're hitting the data analyst stuff. So figure out a problem that those that stack solves, solve it on your portfolio and show that. So um, you should be able to show some reports from Power BI. You should be able to like download some SQL databases, run some power of uh, some Python against to maybe train some data sets or whatever you're using to do. And then um, also you can look at the current jobs out there and see what types of things they do and what types of things they're interviewing for. And then put those types of things on your portfolio. So hope that helps. No, hey, Danny next. T says, can you guys suggest the best way to breaking in as a self-taught web developer? Yeah, learn to code, build a portfolio of projects, learn how to talk about the code inside those projects, and then demo during an interview. Pretty much work with recruiter would be number five. There you go. Um, that's a book. That's the book. <laughs> that is a book. I was just yeah. gonna grab the book. If you want the book, yeah. grab yeah. the book because it literally goes over those steps. Yeah. This is this is this yeah. book is subtitled, by the way, Five Steps to a Life Changing Software Development Job. So it's just about what to do. And then you can self-train, you can go to Coder Foundry, you can go to college. It doesn't really matter how you learn. It does matter what you learn though. And so what we say is right. decide what you want to build. Like I want to build websites. Okay. Then that, that puts you in a camp of three or four major stacks. Don't pick the French stack. Don't pick the, the newest stack. Pick the one that's most mainstream. If you don't know what to pick, pick.net. If you've got an opinion of what you want to do, and that could be Mern stack or Pern stack or whatever, then pick that, but interview for jobs that use that stack and you'll have a better chance. Hope that helps. Uh, Jesse says, would there be big differences between the old portfolio course and the new? And actually BK had yes. a question on this too. Is your new portfolio course, are you doing, including an API that will tie back to the blog? I think it will get there. This, the current version won't include API just quite yet. Um, just because, uh, this is really large. So the difference between the old portfolio course and the new portfolio course, the sections are the same. All right. Yeah. We're building um, kind of a similar the old, thing. Yeah. The old course was like, pick a template, put these sections in them. All right. Here's the sections you need to add or whatever. The new course is starting from a blank slate from the HTML tag all the way down and building it from scratch. It's more about learning still... how to build the individual sections, isn't it? Than building a yeah, portfolio no. per se. I keep saying this thing. It's like yeah. the portfolio is it's just the template. artifact you're building. You're kind of building yeah. your own template. It just happens to be a portfolio, but it could really yeah. be anything. We're using basically using bootstrap and showing people how to like put the whole sections together and the HTML and all right. the CSS. And it's like, that's, it's really about building a page more than anything. Yeah. And it's, I would say it's a medium to advanced CSS and, um, definitely medium to advanced bootstrap. And, um, there's a lot to it. I would say, I don't know how many hours we got in it. So I'm still, yeah, still like working through a couple of the final sections and it'll be out here soon. Um, but, uh, it is pretty, pretty cool. So like, um, I show you how to build like a hover card, for example, instead of using the, the plain Jane bootstrap card. You know, now we can, we can build a hover card and I'll give you two options. Number one, you can use the CSS as a plugin and say, I don't care about CSS. I just want my cool hover card, or you can build out the hover cards and then go deep into the CSS. Like how does that work? And, and talking about like pseudo elements before and after and, and how all that kind of really works to build those different components in it. And so, um, it's, it's pretty detailed. It's pretty lengthy. Uh, but when it, when you get out of it is that you could take this portfolio template, you could turn it into a restaurant site. You can change the colors. It's customizable. So we're using CSS, the root of CSS, where you can like have variables. And then we use CSS the variables. color palettes that we spread throughout our CSS so that we just have to change it in one spot. So one of the things that we do, that's probably different than most themes that you get, whereas it's not really made to, 
the change has been made to download and just kind of modify. This is made to change the look of it. You know, we talk about techniques. overriding bootstrap, that kind of stuff. It's, it's pretty in depth. It is. I think the techniques you learn while making this thing are techniques you'll take and use in a, a bunch of other places. That's the yeah. way I look at it. It's like, oh, that very right. like I saw, I can see like how that would work yeah. and how I would use that somewhere else. That was that's yeah. what I was thinking when I was watching. It. So I think I'm up to 17 videos, and I got about five more to make somewhere. Around. It's gonna be over 20 videos. Yep. And then it's a bunch. They're pretty lengthy. <laughs> so 20 hours of content, probably. I don't know exactly yet. Here you go. I need glasses to feel better than Bobby. Um, if you're blind, yes. <laughs> if you can't see without you can glasses, code better yeah. than me. There's a lot of people do. So like, you know, you can, <laughs> you just commit to your craft, right? The Nana Addy show. Oh, there you go. Uh, no, I don't think, nah. I, <laughs> Unless if you, you can't see the screen. I get this all the time. We don't teach unit testing at Coder Founder. There's a reason. We have 12 weeks. There's a limited amount of time. Knowing how to code is more important than unit testing. Now, I know there's some unit test people out there like, no, it's not. You you know, well, there's nothing unit test if you're not a code. So we teach the most important skill first. Is unit testing important? Yes. Um, currently, right now, you can pick that up and learn it, but you don't need to go to do unit testing, go for a job, because here's what's going to surprise you. Of all the tech Twitter people out there that say unit testing is absolutely necessary and like you're just doing it wrong if you're not doing it. And then you go to a company and they're like, we don't test that we at all. That. <laughs> we don't do that. We don't have time to do that. And you're like, well, but that's what the industry says. Like, well, okay, well, we're not doing it. And so, <laughs> you know, so there's a lot of companies that don't embrace unit testing um, because there is a skill to it. There is a cost involved with doing it. You do have to organize your code in a certain way and you have to write your program in a certain way. And if it's not written that way, well, unit test isn't very helpful. So that's just, that's just my take on it. So therefore, it's not the skill that you need to know. Now, is it good to know it? Yeah, absolutely. Pick it up later. We may release a component on unit testing down the road. We might do sure that. We will. Yeah. Um, but we feel like of the th all the things that we need to put in front of you, that's further down the list just because we need we need to do some we have more plans of like teaching you about building things. Um, instead of just testing things. And there's a lot of people out there that can show you the, the ins and outs of writing unit tests and what you have to do. So, but you don't need to know it for sure. If, I don't know how many people are saying that I'm wrong on that one, but <laughs> Nobody. I'm just saying, man, a lot of companies <laughs> don't use it. Uh, Dakota says, thanks. I'm in the self pace right now. Thank you for being a student. We appreciate it. I think we're taking the course. Uh, finishing up my version of Hundo. Um, I also want to say awesome reformatting of the course, much better user experience. Did we change the hundo part or if we did? We haven't, Not so really, but like, that's good. It's coming though, Dakota, appreciate it. Um, we are going to break it apart and yeah. then, um, to make it uh, more bite-sized chunks. So it's not as one giant course. Yeah. So we're going to, with the bootstrap there. one we've pulled out so far, we're going to add to that too. We talked about that just yesterday. Yeah. So we're going to kind yeah. of break out the different parts. So instead of having one monolithic complete .NET course, it's going to be many courses. Same subscription model. Nothing's going to change. It just makes it easier for you to kind of work through. Um, yeah. We're also trying to figure out a way to put in the video timing things and that kind of stuff as well. Stuff that's like yeah. nice to have stuff that we didn't need to have at launch. But like now we'd right. like from a usability perspective, it'd be kind of nice to have. So yeah, we're definitely working on that. Yeah. yeah. You'll see some things come out here soon. Yep. Uh, let's see. Eduardo Sanchez says, if Java Spring is used for the back end of legacy applications and Node.js for the new ones, where does .NET fit? That is a massive assumption ones. about Yeah, that's, that's, a straw, that's what we call the straw man argument. No one's doing new stuff with .NET. Of course they are. Um, so like I would say that um, Node's been around for a minute. .NET's been around for 20 years. Um, Java Spring has been around for 20 years. People are still writing new stuff with Java Spring and they're writing it with ASP.NET. Um, and if they weren't, Microsoft wouldn't be rolling out new versions of the, of the .NET framework every single year. Um, one of the things that I think where .NET fits in really well is, um, when speed and performance is a, is a must have. And what we're seeing is with, with specifically web API, which is web API is the restful services part of it, where you're building things that don't have a front end. So it's much like node. 
Um, whereas Node, you have this back end and you have a JavaScript front end. So whether that's Vue, Angular, whatever you're putting on top of APIs, what people are seeing is those things are in .NET 6 was easily 50% faster just by pushing the code from .NET 5 to .NET 6. And now .NET 7 is in preview one and they're saying, hey, there's a similar kind of performance jump again. Um, combined with the fact that .NET will run on Linux and on Windows and practically any host, it's very cross-platform. I think a lot of people will adopt it. I mean, people already have adopted it and it's being pushed out into all kinds of organizations. So you could look at someone like United Airlines. Okay, United Airlines, the ticketing, the baggage and all that stuff is all .NET. So do you call that legacy? Do you call it new? I'm sure right. they're working on it every single day. Right. So, I mean, like, you know. Is, yeah, the answer is so, all of the above for all of the all above. All of the above. Too, it's right? used everywhere. And yeah. all three of them are being used. So yeah. don't let someone tell you very... that, like, don't let someone tell you that every new app is all, everything that's new is all Node. It's all Node stuff. No. It's it's like that. Yeah. There's a, it's, it's a vocal minority that, that yes. pushes that out there. Because that's how I do it. And so, therefore, everyone should do it the way I do it. And I think that's what happens when we have these language wars. And I'm not into a language war. Um, the reason I'm on .NET is because the performance increase, the company that's behind it, and that the and the companies have already adopted it. So when you have Microsoft pushing something in the ecosphere, and then when they're committing the millions and millions of dollars to make the language better, to make the tooling better, to make the framework better, to make it faster, and all these things, ultimately they're going to win. So who's doing that for Node? Who's doing that for Java Spring? At what level are they increasing this? And like, you got to look into that and you go, okay, this is probably, they're probably going to win this. Um, because they do, they encircle the entire developer and they want all the developers to use it. Now, 15 years ago, you had you had a case where, hey, you know, it only runs on Windows. And Microsoft had a, a point where we want to sell you Windows Server. Now they want to sell you Azure. Azure is very ag agnostic towards like what it runs on. When you build that thing up on Azure, you don't know what that's running on. Is it running on Windows? Does it matter? No, it doesn't matter. Does it run on Linux? Maybe. Does it matter? No. You're just pushing it to Azure. And I think that's the big shift from Microsoft making their tools and tooling work better with Azure and Azure being the platform of choice to push apps to and competing very hard with AWS. So I think that is really good. And then if you don't think .NET's important, you can go look at the .NET Foundation page. And you can see the people that are supporting the .NET Foundation, which is how do we increase the uses of .NET in the marketplace? And there's corporate sponsors in there. What's the first corporate sponsor listed on that page? I, I can show you, hold on, because it's because it's because it's kind of funny. It's kind of funny that it is this call that the corporate sponsor is this. Hold on. Uh... It's a go. nonprofit to make sure that people know how to use .NET. There you go. Boom. It's .NET Foundation corporate sponsors. Look who's number one. Why? AWS. Why is that? Why is AWS on that page? Because they know there's millions by millions of .NET developers. And what do they want them to use? They don't want them to use Azure. They want them to use AWS. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Microsoft is winning in this tooling market and the language market and how you do things and how you build things. And so... Therefore, the other vendor, the big Kahuna AWS, wants to support .NET on their platforms, 100%. And it runs nicely up there. We have lots of customers that are pushing their stuff to, to AWS using .NET as a backend. So it fits in nicely. I think that uh, it's just, if you listen to this, amount, this vocal minority around Node.js, it's not that it's bad. But I can tell you that when performance matters, it's not even close. Like, if you yeah. need to run tickets for United Airlines, you're not writing that in Node. And trust me, United Airlines can write it in whatever they want. They have billions and billions of dollars to pick whatever they, they want to write it choice. in. They're not, they're not opinionated. Microsoft didn't walk in that door and talk them into it. I mean, like there, there's been a lot of testing there because just because Microsoft says to do it doesn't mean United Airlines is going to do it. They're like, you know, we got tickets to sell here. You know, like <laughs> when we go down, you know, it's, it's a big deal. So like yeah. we need to make it fast and make it work. And our packages and our baggage has to work. You know, people are upset when their luggage doesn't arrive when they land Usually in you know, Austin, Texas. Yeah, exactly. They're upset. <laughs> it's not it's not a great environment. And people can like not fly the airline because their systems are crap. 
ticking doesn't work or it's always down or I can't get rerouted or my package doesn't show up. So when it absolutely has to work, I think that's where .NET really, really fits in and really shines. It's not in Java. It's not in JavaScript. It's in C Sharp back in. I'm sure they have JavaScript front end somewhere and like they're doing other things, oh, but sure. like, yeah. Anyway, yeah. that's my two cents on that. I don't know what American Airlines runs on, but that's my like most. Um, yeah, I don't know. Related. I mean, you know, I just happened to the talk worst. to one of the senior architects at <laughs> United Airlines one day, and it's just really interesting to hear them talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Cheddar kind of sums up with be language agnostic, be adaptable. So there you go. Here's what I think. You're, you're not going to be agnostic. I do think you need to be adaptable. But in general, I don't know if you're a coder, but if you are a cheddar, you probably specialize in something. You can't run out there and go, oh, I'm just going to do it however you want me to do it. There's a lot of people that say that. Very few do that in practice. They tend to gravitate to the thing they know really well. Office so if you know React know everything. Node really well, you're going to solve those problems better than you trying to pick up ASP.NET and say, I'm going to be productive in the next six days. I could have done this in React easier because I, that's what I know. Same thing in Java. You know now, So you're never going to be truly agnostic. Can you do all of those things? Yeah, at a senior level, you can do anything. But you're always going to pick the thing that you feel most productive in. Now, can we be adaptable when new things come out? We should be. We're programmers. It shouldn't really matter, but it does matter in form of like how, how performant can you be right off the bat today with technology stack X. And so um, I think that, and I'm not really harping on cheddar, but when new learners come in, and they say, it doesn't matter what you learn. And they just say, learn whatever. And that's when it happens when you see people say, I'm learning nine things. I ain't got a job yet. Like, what am I doing wrong? Well, you didn't specialize. Specialize first. Figure out what you want to build. Web, mobile, desktop. Figure out between those three. Typically, data science can be thrown in there. Pick the most dominant stack of the thing that you're going to build that with. So if that's mobile, okay, maybe that is Flutter. Maybe it's not .NET Maui right now, okay? Maybe it is something like React Native, okay? You pick your web, ASP.NET, pretty strong bet. React Native, Angular is another bet. Those you can learn. Desktop, pretty much it is a really strong bet that WinForms WPF on the .NET side is the way to go now. With .NET MAUI, we're going to eventually be pushing that to Mac OS. That is where you want to be right there. Data science, definitely in Python. That's the way it is So right now. So, like, you know, there's a stack that specializes for the problem at hand. Uh, pick out what you want to build, pick the most dominant stack, get a job. Now, if you're already working, you know, three things already, pick a fourth thing. Yeah, whatever you, you, you like. can yeah. do that. But I promise you, once you pick the new thing, that's your next job and you're going to do that for a minute. And you, you're not really agnostic. You're just like, this is what I'm doing right now. Do I learn new things? Do I have new things? Do I know other things in the past? Yeah. I do Power Builder. Am I doing Power Builder today? Absolutely not. Would I do Power Builder? No. Could I do PHP? No, I, I could. I don't want to. I want to do the things that I'm very centered around what I'm doing. So that's how I look at that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Hamad wants to know, currently a sophomore studying computer science from South uh, Asian country. I've learned front-end mm -hmm. development. Can I work remotely in the U.S. while I, while I am not graduating? Yet? I don't know. I mean, maybe. Uh, can you prove that you can do it and... That's that's the thing, you know. Can you be available when they need you to be? Are you there? Can you do you have the skills? So if you can do all those things, maybe yes. So my advice is you're probably gonna have to hook up with a company in your country that has U.S. contracts. Um, I think it would be a rare case where you Hamad would work directly um, for a company on a what we call a corp to corp basis or a 1098 basis as your first project. Typically you'll work for someone in your comp your country that is working remotely for us companies. I think that would be more common. Um, now, could you go to Fiverr or top Tool or something like that and get a side gig? I think you could, maybe you might could do that too. And that helps too. If you need to build out your portfolio yeah. as well, you can, yeah. Like so a smaller well. bite-sized chunk projects that are really small in scale. You don't have to be there at 9 a.m. necessarily. You just do a fiber project and build it out. 
and then hand it off to them. So there's a couple ways to get that done. Yeah, Anthony says, are dynamic programming questions part of non-fang web dev jobs? Or is that an area where it would be better to actively build projects to gain more knowledge of that area? Priority is why I'm asking. I like that you're asking the question. <laughs> yeah, I think sometimes and sometimes not. It depends on the job. Um, depends on kind of where you're interviewing for. Um, one thing we do see is that these program questions go in spurts. They go, they ride together. Yeah. Um, and so one of the things that was asked to a student last week or two weeks ago, three weeks ago, maybe was, um, Hey, if you wanted to print a hundred numbers on the screen, how would you do that without a for loop? Oh yeah. And so, <laughs> yeah. And so like I would, I started like coding that up as using a recursive algorithm and like, okay, this is how you would have answered that. And so, um, I think I'm going to release a video just on certain things like that on YouTube here that just says, here's how you would do those kind of things. So they do go in spurts and they do go in, um, there's a group think around this. I don't know how it happens. It just happens. I don't know. There's no like, you know, group that all the companies go to, and yeah. go, hmm, how can we trip up students today? Yeah, exactly. You yeah. know, but like, uh, I do see, I see that recursive algorithm questions are being asked more frequently lately. Um, so you should understand that. So, but then it'll go to, you know, if you're working for a company and they're all about like, you know, parallel tasks or threading, then you may get a lot of questions for that company because that's what they do. So, um, I still think you can look up the top 30 interview questions with your stack on Google. And if you know those top 30, I think you're going to be fine. Hey, Nathan says, what programming language should I need to learn first when it comes to specializing web dev, C-sharp and Java? You can't talk about this a little bit already. You're asking me and I'm going to give you my answer. And I have two to pick from there. C-sharp is what I would pick. Now, depending on where you live, Java could be more in demand where you live. But if you're in the US, I think that C sharp is a extremely safe bet and learning ASP.NET MVC is really good. That's what we teach you at the bootcamp. It's because that's where we think the jobs are. We would change it if, if the marketplace shifts in some way. Which, which, which we were talking just, about earlier, actually, it's funny because yeah. there's always, I think, I feel like I always talk about that here all the time because somebody's yeah. like, ah, oh, you're, you're just saying C sharp and .NET because you yeah. sell a C sharp and .NET course. It's like, no, 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 hold on. Reverse that. We sell a C sharp and .NET course because because everybody wants everybody that. Everybody wants it. Like it's <laughs> yeah, the other way yeah. around. Like right. It's, I mean, and if it was something I'm not else, a, we'd be selling something else. Like it's yeah. So this isn't this isn't a religious endeavor for me. This is a this is a, an endeavor where we try to like look at the marketplace. What do they want? Teach them. Teach what the marketplace wants. That's really what we're looking at. I could teach React next week if I wanted to, and that's what I would do if I felt like it would give us a better opportunity. I just don't think it does. Yep. No, they, those opportunities could be equal. Just a quick uh, oh, thanks, man. thing from Johanna. Thank appreciate you, it. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, we like to be here watching. Cool. Yeah, we've got six minutes here. So if you've got a burning question, super chat us now so we can get it in. Yep, otherwise I've got enough right. to carry us to the end. So focus yeah. says, uh, after building, say a bug tracker, wouldn't the interviewer say you just followed the steps to build this? <laughs> Basically saying like, oh, you built this just by following something. Um, okay. So here's the thing. Like if you did, it would take about 30 seconds for them to throw you out of the room and know that you weren't know, you didn't know what you were talking about. Cause you, let's yeah. say that, like, let's say that you went even one step further than that, right? Why would you even follow along and build it? You would just like grab somebody else's bug tracker, surely, and pass it off as your own, right? It's right. the same thing. If you don't understand it, it's pointless. Right. I don't think an interview has ever said that directly to any student coming ahead of Coder Foundry. Typically when right. they show it, like, oh, that's kind of cool. Yeah. And your job as an interviewer is to explain your code. And, and here's how I would answer that question. If I'm sitting there and a, a student was asked that, I would coach the student this way. If the interviewer says, man, you just went to Coder Foundry. You just followed what Bobby said. You just, you just, yeah. you know, that you just followed <laughs> the steps. Anyone could yeah. have built that. And I'm just like, well, let me show you the ticket detail page. Now I think that the ticket detail page 
shows you kind of the complexity involved in doing this. And let me walk you through that code base so you can see um, how this really works behind the scenes. And then you give them a code review and you talk about the code, then they'll realize like, oh, you did more than follow a bunch of videos. You actually understand this. Now, the difference here at Coder Foundry than every single course at Udemy, and we get asked this a lot, hey, can you just give me the GitHub? Not happening. You have to yeah. type it in yeah. because we believe typing it in causes you to learn, which means that sometimes you type it in wrong, then you don't see, and you have errors and you have problems and you we see the, the questions coming up in Discord. Could we eliminate a lot of these questions by just giving people a GitHub repo? Yes, but then you wouldn't learn. And so our job is to make sure that people learn. It's not about completion for us, it's about learning so that you can actually talk about it and get a job. And so that struggle of typing it in, we think is a necessary thing for, uh, for you to learn. And we've had people say, hey, it'd be a whole lot easier if I could get the completed code base and, and compare it to mine and do it. And what we see from our experience is sometimes students will trade code and the lesser student will start taking code from other students and just trying to paste it in there to get it to Never work works out. and then understand how it works and it ends up being broke anyway. And so like, it's better for you to just type it in on your own and then talk about your code. Remember all this is, is a sales tool. If they, if they're impressed to say, Hey, you just follow the steps. Well, let me show you how those steps worked. Um, that's what I would do. Why don't we take a look at the code and let's see if, if you feel like that I'm a good fit for <laughs> you. Exactly. Let's, let's look at it. Yeah. You know, I think so I am. if I mean, you did, I, you're going to last, like yeah. I say, about 30 seconds, because the first question yeah. that comes about your code that you can't answer, it's going to be very yeah. obvious that you didn't write it. Yeah, it's it's way harder than most people think when they start looking at it. And they're like, oh, OK, how many entities are in this? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like 20. Right. How many services did you write? Yeah, 15 or whatever it is, you know, like, right. OK, how did you handle authentication authorization? Wow, OK. It's multi-tenant, yes. <laughs> so, yeah. like, there's a lot Trust of things me, that the, you can like these, really. And these are problems win, that, that people guy, win every day. The person interviewing you understands what these things mean, right? They understand what it takes to implement authorization authentication. They understand what multi-tenant yeah. is because they're either doing it or maybe they can't even do it. You never know, like, right. you know. But they're going to understand how complex that is. Right. So, so yeah. one of the most famous um coding boot camp things out there is chris Steele and his qu Colt thing Steel. about yelp camp Colt yeah. Steele, sorry Colt Steele, yelp camp and it's like and when you look at yelp camp Colt Steele has done he sold more courses than we have so he's done he's way more successful than i am but <laughs> when you look at the two projects just on the root level the bug tracker project is way more complicated than say yelp camp it, it shows a lot more features, a lot more attention to detail as far as the design views and layout, the database, and, and it actually being a complete functional bug tracker. Yelp camp doesn't do a whole lot. You know, it takes some pictures, has some stuff, but it doesn't really, really, really solve a business problem. In other words, if you want to run that out for a true, I want to register for, to put pitch my tent at a national park, you take Yelp camp, there's about 10 other things that that thing's got to do for you to do it. Payments being one of them, but there's a lot of other information that needs to happen. So our approach here at Coder Foundry is we want to build an enterprise grade software that you could sell. In fact, last week, a girl showed the bug tracker and she's in negotiations with that company for them to purchase it. Oh, did that happen? Yeah. So oh, I can cool. tell you the name later. Okay. So, uh, okay, you know, awesome. Okay. I don't think we've talked about that. So that's, that's pretty awesome. cool. And so like, they're like, can we buy that? Can we use that? Like, how do we get that? We would like to use that here. That is, you can say whatever you want. You can't just follow the steps and build something at the level the butt tracker is without understanding it. There's, it's just, it's too lengthy. You guys know yeah. there's 50 hours of video in this thing. And like, that's a lot of steps, yeah. <laughs> you know, that it's you gonna, can just, some of that info is going to get you know, crammed in there. Like whether you like yeah, it, or it's going to get in that brain eventually. <laughs> like, well, you'll, after you write your eighth service, you're like, okay, I think I understand services at this point. Um, even if I am following along with the video, it's not 10 steps. It, there's a lot to it. So I would say yeah. focus, build it and then come back and tell me how much you know about it. You'll see. Right. You'll, you'll learn a lot. Right. It's funny. Look, actually, 
Ridge Raider here says, I didn't think I was retaining a lot through the videos until I saw the instructors make a small typo somewhere and I caught myself talking to the screen. It's like yelling at it's it. Like right it's right there. there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You try doing it in the live class. Like I'm doing it in a live class type of stuff up. People are like following along with it. Hey, yeah, you misspelled div. I'm like, oh, yeah. 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 Thanks. It's, it's hard to talk in time at the same time. Did you get the job? She also? has multiple yeah. offers. Rich okay. okay. It's awesome. She's working through those right now. So very new and like uh multiple offers as well that's awesome that's awesome um megan wants to know if we can take a look at her resume and github um it's funny because we've actually been thinking about doing more into like we didn't so every tuesday we've been doing these portfolio reviews the last couple of tuesdays we may add like linkedin and resume to that as well at some point yeah Maybe i think like linkedin is thing. important resume is what I think is important slash not I don't important. think you need to do a lot like, of them. Yeah, I think there's yeah. just, I think resume is the third one. It's, it's what put it this way it is necessary for you to have one. And if you do it rightly, it can move the need. If you're just breaking out, your resume is never going to be good enough to really get you a job. So you have to right. like somehow it just get gets you past the initial screening part is what right. you really needed to do. <laughs> right. So Megan, if you have stuff in GitHub, Make sure that's published, rule number one. So don't rely just on GitHub because no recruiter will ever clone a repo and try to get it running. So you need to have your code that's in there. It's also got to be published so someone can see it. For free, Netlify. For free, backend, Heroku. That's what we do here at the self paced course. We need a backend process. We're going to Heroku. If we just have a static portfolio site or just a JavaScript only site, we're pushing those to Netlify. Um, and your resume should have your portfolio in a link. So um, I was working with a student on, in, it's funny, I play video games with a bunch of dudes and uh, one of them is going through college. He says, hey, can you look at resume? I've seen your stuff on online. Can you help okay. me with my Ooh. resume? Yeah. And he's in like theater. He's not a coder at all. I'm like, I'll try, I, you know, I don't know. And so like, um, I look at it and I, right away, I said, do you have a portfolio? And he goes, yeah. I'm like, okay. so." why isn't that link on your resume? He says, well, my instructor said, don't do it because I'm going to be handing it out in print and you can't click on a printed document. And I said, well, have you ever emailed it as a PDF? And he goes, yeah, okay, those are clickable. So how are they going to find it if it's not in the print document? And he goes, you have a good point. I said, yes, <laughs> I mean, your portfolio should be at the, yeah, spell it out, come up with a good domain name, yeah. put it at the top of the of the resume and say hey to know more about me to see what i can do go to this link yep and it's, it's clickable, clickable. It's PDF, you send a pdf or they can type it in if it's not, a piece of paper type it in people type in urls every single day it was like the worst advice ever it was like <laughs> well if it's not clickable don't put it on there like okay yeah you can't so, and, and that point, go to the then, company you're either not, you're then trying to trade only on your experience and if you don't have any right. That, that resume then make becomes it. like you get you get no chance. It, I mean, you can't prove you're doing yeah. it because you're not showing your your portfolio and you don't have the experience. Yeah. You're never going to get anywhere. Yeah. Um, then I worked with yeah. another student that's trying to get jobs in a different arena altogether, and he just happened to know me, and we're friends with his family and stuff like that. And so, uh, at the same time, I told him to build a portfolio because he wanted to have jobs that are centered around his MBA, which he had a betting model would show like how to bet on NBA games. Well, okay. Okay. He had like, it seems kind of weird. How do you show that? Well, we need to get that in a spreadsheet. And you know, there was a lot of things. So no matter what you're doing, whether that's coding or whatever, if you can demonstrate what you can do and people can easily get there, you're more than likely to get an interview. You will definitely perform better in getting interviews. And then you'll perform better during the interview because you have something to talk about. You know, just like I'm a hard worker isn't going to cut it. Yeah. It so, yeah. Yep. Yep. Hopefully that helps. I haven't seen your resume yet, Megan. I hope that helps. Um, Megan, if you want to just uh, go on Discord and you can DM it to me and I'll take a look. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll take a look, look at it. Uh, yeah. If you're not in there, the links are one the more for the road here. One more for the road. So we got another one. Uh, I know I went over. I ranted today. Yeah. Today's a rant day. I feel like yeah. I'm talking too much. Um, oh, it's just not a thing, but yeah. look, what we're talking about the same thing. Use QR codes in printed resumes for links. Boom. Yeah. Good idea. I like that. I like that. Um, you have to trust the person handing you the resume. That's just the thing, but you know. That's yeah, but I would I would put it as a But I put if somebody's coming for an interview, like I would. And then I would say, here's the QR code for it right there. I think that's a great idea. That's a perfect idea. 
Yep. Speaking of QR, I like it. I hope you trust yeah. us because this one up here, you can do a uh, uh, win a MacBook. <laughs> you win a MacBook if you click that one. The uh, great or, or you can go to codefriendly.com slash giveaway. It's the same, same, same yeah. thing. That, that's that's yep. where that takes you. So, uh, it's to fill out a form. And, uh, sweepstakes, you don't have to uh, um, buy anything. It is a no purchase necessary sweepstakes. You've got to be in the US to win the prize, though. And we're giving away when we hit a hundred thousand subs. So, you know, sub us up if you want to win. So, you know, yeah. maybe talk to your, to your people that don't know about the contest. Hey, sub this channel. Why? Well, you just do. Just exactly. I want to win a Mac. I mean, um, get your uncle's <laughs> dog to subscribe because we know he has a channel. Like, yeah, you know, whoever it is, if your pet cat, who mine's sleeping down here. He has a channel. He doesn't have a channel, yeah, but he should have a channel. All right. Um, yeah, cool. Um, let me see. Let's do this last one. Not a plan, I promise. One. Alexander, how many hours of content in the self-paced course? It is, you can answer that better than I can. A lot. Yeah, it is a lot. It, it was so, before we added the new stuff, it was just, actually Ridge Raider counted it for us. It was just, I think it was just under 100, just over 100. It was about 100 hours worth, right? Um, we're more than that now. In, in video content, yeah, yeah. So that's, and that's like, if you literally watched it real time, back to back to back, it'd be 100 hours long. Now, with with anything right you can take a 15 minute tutorial it can take you an hour to kind of get through it so right we know the content that's in there is more than the virtual boot camp now in the virtual boot camp we spend seven to eight hundred hours in class time yeah plus i think doing it. i think you need to plan on three to six months building everything out on a part-time schedule so um if you're looking at how how detailed it is and we're going to continue to add to it um, filling in places where we feel like we could be stronger um, and so that we can early on in the course, maybe do some more kind of fun foundational stuff, improving some things in certain areas where, you know, we can make it better and then adding on more complex stuff at the end in .NET 6 and .NET 7. Yep. We're going to have some so, uh, free stuff coming up too. Yeah. Um, that's we got a free, our first free one. Yeah. So if you're not, um, you're not subscribed, you know, I think uh, some free thing is going to come out here. Maybe when today, tomorrow, something maybe. Like yeah, maybe. Um, I just got to work the, the back end to get it to, to so you can sign up for a free account on the offer side. Yeah. But the content's ready. Yeah. So we put together a quick um, little published to Netlify course. So yeah. make some page changes and publish to Netlify because it helps us twofold. It helps people who haven't published to Netlify before and want to know how to do that. It'll teach them that. But also helps us on the inbound too. It's one of the things we're actually going to ask our inbound students to do. Yeah, so we're going to so sign into the, cool. the course and they're going to uh, create their first uh, web page and publish it to Netflix. So. Yeah. So and there's a lot of content in this. So we're trying to get more granular um, and expose how much content is in our self-paced course because we get that question a lot. Yeah. So we we'll make that change in the next week or so to where you can just go and look and see a table of contents. You're like, oh. There's a lot of stuff in here. <laughs> so instead yeah. of like, yeah. it's um, when you when you look at Udemy courses, say, hey, the .NET Complete Coding Bootcamp, it's typically a course. Think of this as multiple courses around JavaScript, around Bootstrap, um, and also in .NET. And we have multiple projects inside of .NET. So we're going to build several JavaScript projects and um, several .NET projects, not Bug Tracker, Movie Pro, Address Book. Um, there's several of them in there as, as, as blog as well. So most courses would center in around like, Hey, we're going to teach you .NET and you're going to build a blog. Well, here you're going to build four of those things because we want you to have a portfolio that you can show that literally knocks the socks off people. And they're like, wow, okay. That's a lot of stuff. Like you built all this. Yes. I built it all, you know? So that's, that's what we're trying to do. Hopefully okay. it helped you out. Oh, well, we're a little bit over, so we're going to call it a day. We're back call on Tuesday. I think you be back on Tuesday. Are we going to do your portfolios again Tuesday? Maybe if we, as long as people still want us to do that, where we can, or we can talk about something else. So, um, yeah, we'll see. hey, hit us up and um, if you've got a video idea and you want to go to our Discord channel and, and send me an idea that you'd say, man, I wish you would do a video on this. Just there's a video <laughs> yeah. ideas section and we would love to do that. We've got our own ideas, but in, just in case you're like, hey, this would be amazing if you did something on that. Yep. Yep. We'll do it for you and hit us up in Discord. Yeah. So cool. Thanks for hanging out with us. We appreciate it. And uh, right. thanks for All giving right. us plenty of questions. We was Good luck. Keep coding. We'll see you on Tuesday. See you guys later. Mm -hmm.